and welcome to the May 3rd online service of Fairview Presbyterian Church in Lawrenceville, Georgia. Welcome to our service and welcome to our church today. I'm Lisa Grimsley, the music director of the church. I, along with Wendy Foy, will be your lay readers today. Our pastor, Stephanie Bishop, is on vacation today. So in her place for the sermon today, we have Reverend Betsy Turner. She is the interim pastor at Stockbridge Presbyterian Church. She holds a Bachelor of Arts from Presbyterian College in Clinton, South Carolina, and a Master of Divinity from Columbia Theological Seminary. She and her husband, Ian, live in the lakeside area of Atlanta with their three children. Sisters and brothers, let us worship together with glad and generous hearts. For, For many, many signs, signs and, and wonders, wonders have been done, done among us. us. Let us break bread together and be open to sharing our lives in new ways. Let us, let us give, give what we can, can to all who, all who have needs, needs so that all, so people, that all people, no matter who no they matter are, who may regard us, may good regard us with good will. Let us devote ourselves to our prayers and to the gospel. For in this, For in way, this way, God will God add, will to, add our to our numbers every, every day. day. Good Shepherd, you call us by name and we know your voice. Open the gates for us that we may come and go freely. Have life and have it abundantly. We pray that your Holy Spirit will strengthen us to be devoted to the teachings of your word, that through it we may hear your voice and follow it into eternal life. Amen. Psalm 23 The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me into right, in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days in my, of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Our scripture reading today is the last part of Acts chapter 2. It's been an eventful chapter in the Bible and in the life of the early church. It started on the day of Pentecost with the gift of the Holy Spirit a story we will read in a couple of weeks ago when we celebrate Pentecost and the church's birthday. Immediately after the Spirit comes, Peter stands up and begins to preach the story of Jesus and the saving news of God's grace. And it works. 3,000 people, we're told, were added that day and came to believe. In the midst of all of those events, the people, the crowd, asked two really good questions, which I want to argue are also critical questions for us to be asking today. When the Spirit came, the people asked, what does this mean? And then when Peter spoke, they asked, what should we do? Our reading today is the very end of Acts chapter 2, and it is the church's first answer to those two critical questions. I'm reading from Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, 
the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had a need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having the good will of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So the people ask, what does this mean? What does the Holy Spirit mean? And the church answers, it means radical community. It means worship and fellowship and prayer together. It means being centered around Christ-like hospitality and generosity, and it means glad and generous hearts. The people ask, what should we do? What should we do in response to this gospel? We have heard this news of grace, and the church answers, we should be together, not just gathering in a common space, at the temple or at home, but being together in one mind and heart and purpose. And remarkably, also one purse. We're told they shared everything, distributing resources as anyone had a need. This is a beautiful, inspirational, grand depiction of the early Christian community, living together in perfect harmony, gathering constantly, sharing fully, and growing continually. But I wonder if the church really fully lived this way, or if perhaps the writer of Acts, traditionally that's Luke, is looking back at the history and remembering those early days of the church with selective memory, through rose-colored glasses, imagining in hindsight that everything was simpler and purer and more perfect way back when. We call that impulse nostalgia. And according to the wise writer and comedian John Hodgman, nostalgia is a toxic impulse. It is the twinned yearning delusion that A, the past was better, which it wasn't, and B, that the past can be recaptured, which it can't. Nostalgia is a dangerous temptation for the church. We tend to remember the good parts and fondly idealize the past, and that looking back, that yearning for the past, especially when we get distracted or obsessed or bogged down in it, can prevent us from being grateful and being attuned to the spirit in the present. And it can hold us back from moving forward and being hopeful about the future to which God is leading us. But here's the thing about that text from Acts chapter two. We know that the early church was not as picture perfect as the passage I read you earlier would make it seem. They must not have been that way, at least not for any length of time. And we know that because we've read the rest of the New Testament, which is mostly letters dealing with all the ways the church didn't live up to those lofty goals, the ways the church fell short of that beautiful nostalgic portrait. You can check out 1 Corinthians 6 or James 4, or pretty much the whole book of Galatians, or a lot of other places in the New Testament to find how the early church wrestled and wrangled and squabbled and the ways that they struggled in a lot of the same ways that we do. The challenges of surviving and thriving in a changing neighborhood and a changing world. Church drama and infighting and power struggles, if you can believe such a thing how to fund a ministry, and how to share and be generous within and beyond the church. 
how to make sense of hard things and faithfully face the realities of scarcity and anxiety, and fear, temptation, and injustice, the brokenness of the world, the brokenness of our hearts, and the specter of death itself. They faced strong differences of opinion on theology and polity and the practice of faith, and they found that those differences sometimes tore them apart. And they asked questions of how to keep the gospel and the church relevant in a secular and constantly changing world, and how to pass the faith on to the next generation. You see, the past is always more complicated than we nostalgically remember. And we certainly can't go back to the way it was, the way it was before this pandemic, or the way it was with a previous pastor, or back to the good old days, which only exist in our imagination. It is simply not fruitful or faithful to obsess about the past or get bogged down in it. Whether that past that you're talking about is two months ago, before all of this, or two years ago, under that other pastor, or two or four or six decades ago when things were so different for the church, or long ago in the early church, no matter how rosy an image our writer in Acts paints for us. Thanks be to God, the only way that God leads us is forward, but always faithfully. God goes with us into new spaces, into new leadership, into new normal. Think about the Israelites in the wilderness, not knowing how or when or where they would find the promised land, but God was with them as a pillar of cloud and fire. Or Ruth, sticking with Naomi on the long journey from Moab to Judah, a land Ruth did not know in a life she did not know what to expect. And yet God was faithful to those women on their journey together. Or the disciples dropping their nets and leaving behind their livelihoods and everything familiar and secure because they were going with Jesus. This season of transition in the life of the church and this time of pandemic for the world with all that is shifting and uncertain and scary. As we are waiting for and discovering and imagining, and as we will create that new normal that we're going to have to live into, now is a time to ask ourselves the very questions that people asked on Pentecost. What does this all mean? And what should we do? And I want to suggest that one place that we can look for answers to those questions is this grand vision that we found in Acts chapter 2. But I don't want us to look at it out of nostalgia, but instead out of hope. Let's not think of this passage as an idealized past that we are trying to recapture and get back to. But instead, let's see this as a description a vision of the future, uh, something God might be setting out in front of us as a way forward and an inspiration for what we will be and can be and are called to be by that Holy Spirit, a community built on worship and fellowship and prayer, a family of faith practicing radical hospitality and abundance, sharing resources, giving generously to anyone who has a need. A spirit-led church that gathers not only in traditional holy spaces like the temple and the sanctuary, but also makes and maintains connections and finds holiness in homes and at table and on the street. And yes, my friends, for us online in virtual spaces a glad and generous people who live in awe and watch for signs and wonders. 
a growing and vibrant community whose life together and whose goodwill for all people is attractional and welcomes others in day by day so that the church and the kingdom grow both in depth of faith, but also reaching more people with God's love. May it be so, not in some nostalgic past, but in the present reality of the church and in the future, to which God is leading us even now. Thanks be to God for the vision. Amen. Let us pray. Shepherding God in a dangerous world, let us hear your voice and come and go through your gate. We pray for the whole church that we may be devoted to your word and to universal fellowship, being generous to all who have need. We pray for the earth, for green pastures and still waters, that we may restore them to the goodness and purity that they had at the time you created them. We pray for the people of the world, their nations and leaders, that your wisdom and peace may govern all, so that no one will fear, especially during the time of this pandemic. We pray for all those in need, for those in want, those ill, and those dying, those who are alone, that we may be the banquet you have set before them as we anoint them, feed them, and comfort them in your name. Please continue to be with C.N. Giddings and Leslie Harrison as they continue to heal. We pray for ourselves, O oh God, our families, and those we love. May no one live in fear. May all dwell in your presence. Blessed are you, great shepherd, who through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit gives us goodness and mercy leads us down the right paths and restores our souls. We praise you this day and lift up to you the prayer your Son, Jesus Christ, taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Church, our God has prepared a table before us. Even in our own places, our cup overflows. So let us give generously from our common wealth as our way of praising God and giving to those in need.
Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, you have anointed us and we are yours. Bless these tithings and offerings that they may become green pastures and still waters for any and all who need your comfort and restoration. Amen. I charge you now, my friends, to go forth from this time of worship to love and serve the Lord. Go asking hard questions and seeking faithful answers. Go rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and go knowing and trusting and believing that you do not go alone. For God goes before us and Christ is at our side and the Spirit is within and among us as we move forward. Knowing this, my friends, be at peace. Amen.